All right, we have reached the appointed hour and we have a quorum, so I'll call the meeting to order. Uh, it is being recorded. Uh, you probably heard that announcement. Um, and I'll read the standard opening statement. This is the Northampton Conservation Commission for the 9th of May, 2024. The commission is a group of unpaid volunteers who work to protect the natural environment of Northampton. We are concerned with the aid interests defined in the Massachusetts Wetland Protection Act. And our duties also include open space acquisition and management. We operate in a way that's consistent with open meeting law requirements. While meeting dates, times, and agendas are posted in advance, and we invite public comment during our meetings. However, we ask the public to limit their comments to issues that are within our purview. Today's agenda includes uh, a request for determination of applicability to determine if drinking water well installation within the riverfront area is subject to the Wetlands Act or the City Wetlands Ordinance, this on Turkey Hill Road. Uh, then a notice of intent for construction of three family homes, uh, three single family homes within the buffer zone uh, on Landy Avenue, uh, and a request for determination of applicability to determine if grading related to Pickleball court construction is subject to the Wetlands Act or the Wetlands Ordinance, uh, this at Ellerbrook uh, Athletic Fields. Um, and finally, a notice of intent for a walkway deck and landscaping within the riverfront area of the Mill River, this uh, at uh, 60 Federal Street. Um, and then we also have an application for a certificate of compliance at 17 Spring Street. Uh, first item, I'll ask if there's any general public comment not having to do with a case that we'll be reviewing today. If not, uh, we'll go to approval of minutes. Sarah sent out some minutes from uh, November um, and they looked good to me. Does someone want to make a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. Got a motion. Mo I'll take Jen as a motion and David as the second. Uh, any amendments, modifications? Um, if not, uh, Sarah, roll call. All in favor? All right. So roll call vote for those. David? Yes. Jen? Yes. Paul? I abstain. I wasn't there. <laughs> and Kevin? Yes. All right. Thank you. Hey, Sarah. I. Um, and Beth, I missed you. I'm sorry. And Beth. No, it's okay. <laughs> I'll also I'll also uh, vote yes. All right. So first case is a request for determination of applicability to determine if drinking water well installation within the riverfront uh, is subject to the Wetlands Act or the Wetlands Ordinance. Uh, this is a Turkey Hill Road. Um, someone here to uh, present on that? Hi. Uh, yeah. Um, Terry Reynolds. Um, T. Reynolds Engineering. So, um, if I can share my screen, I can put it up and show you folks what I'm looking to do. Sure, you can just one second. Okay, you should be all set. All right. So. This is a project at the end of Turkey Hill Road, and it's previously been approved for wetlands, and you, you all are probably familiar with it, creating a parking lot uh, at, uh, in the beginning of the conservation area and then a driveway going up the hill. Um, so what we're back here for is we've had trouble getting a well to uh, be adequate up at the top of the hill. And so now we're looking to drill a well down here, halfway up the driveway. Um, and it's it's within the two, just within the 200 foot riverfront. Um, so looking at um, basically putting a pad in the driveway and the a temporary pad will extend a little bit off the driveway. Um, and so that's gonna be done um, with putting matting down gravel and then when they're done drilling, they're going to take the gravel up and pull the matting back. Um, the drilling itself um, will consist of a pad right here. Um, it will have a, a sump 
uh, in front of it um, for um, any um, spoils coming out of the hole. Um, put a sequencing here. So basically install a silt fence around the work area, excavate the slurry pit. And so that'll be right in front of the drilling area right in here. Um, and then prep the level pad, so on. Um, install pumps into the slurry pit. Um, so pumps will take the, the water coming out from the drilling efforts and pump it across to a, a silt bag over here in the swale on the other side. Um, so any water coming out will be prevented from going down a hill. It'll then go down, any, any discharge water will go down through the barriers um, all the way down to the basin. There is a culvert right here, and that's going to be temporarily blocked for while they're doing the drilling so that no water goes over towards the river. Um, so any, any discharge water is going to go in here. The basin is currently set up as a temporary basin, so the bottom uh, has been filled with a couple feet of sand that will be removed later when the media is installed in it, and we'll have an engineered media down the road. But for now, it's set up just to take um, construction sediment into the basin, and that's where all of this will go. Um, so it's a pretty minor impact in here. Um, right now, uh, what will be impacted is there's a small, uh, you know, uh, I would say a foot and a half diameter laurel bush, and then a little, um, a very small group of uh, um, like half inch suckers of a uh, little cherry um, that will be that will be impacted when they put the pad in temporarily. Um, so uh, the intent is when they pull it all back is to loam and seed it with uh, um, upland erosion control mix. Um, and then the rest of the area is just part of the driveway construction. So that, that's about it. It's a two to three day process for them to do the drilling and hopefully it'll all go successfully. Questions from commissioners? When do you expect to do the work? Um, it probably won't happen until June at this point. They're trying to um, do concrete work up at the top. That needs to get done. And once that's done, the, then they have a window in which they can do the drilling. What kind of additional shrub planting is going to be needed? Uh, right now, there really aren't. You know, as I said, the, there's really not much being impacted. Um, there, there's a very small mountain laurel that will get have to get removed. Um, that could get dug up with a scoop and put aside and put back after, you know, um, that sort of thing. But other than that, that's that's all that's going to be impacted. Okay. So the the uh, the square area outside the roadway that. Um, it, it may be on this chart, but I'm not able to. Uh, it's a 24 by 40 pad that's being proposed in here. So you can see the fence here bumps out. That kind of encompasses the air, additional area that they may need to um, have some disturbance in, temporary disturbance. But, but the, the, uh, the, the work pad the, is a uh, also on the existing drive. So I'm trying to see yeah, what is so, incremental. So the, the work pad, this square right here uh -huh. is, is the pad area. So, I see. so it's just that this corner little corner right. that's okay. coming off the edge. Got it. Thank you. That's helpful. Right. And, and the slurry pit, is that in the existing driveway? The slurry pit is sort of in the driveway. It's right, right in this area. So there's a little bit off, a little bit in. So the, the driveway was constructed with a big shoulder along this whole edge. And so this was all, all put down with gravel and so on. Um, so the, the drive lane is here and then there's a turnout area that's all over here. So the, the original plan was to uh, locate the well at the top of the hill? 
Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Actually, they've made two attempts at wells at the top of the hill and had um, insufficient um, results. Right now, the current well is right here, and they're getting a half a gallon a minute out of it. And they do oh, 1,200 okay. feet. <laughs> Trickle. Uh, okay. Yeah. Oh. Uh, Terry, this isn't wetlands related at all, but um, what what is the plan if there is insufficient flow from this well? <laughs> Pun. Um, there, there really isn't a plan. Yeah. Open. Um, we're going to, you know, because we've got two spots up at the top that were basically dry and 1,200 feet down. We're hoping moving down to the lower areas, we might find better results. There are wells down here that were successful for the houses down in this area. You know, I suppose if this fails and maybe we'll approach uh, the owner of this property and see if we can drill down there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then, at, at, assuming you're successful, um, at some point, the, where will the trench be located to uh, sink the supply pipe? The supply pipe is already installed. It's running along the edge of the driveway right here. I see. Oh, the water. I see. But when they, when they, um, at this <laughs> point, the the driveway has have has the formal subgrade put down on it and it has a hard pack that was put down for erosion control purposes along with the electrical and cable conduit okay. system yep. that's all been installed at this point so they installed the water at the same time oh yeah right okay and you have you have to extend it if you went to the neighbor yeah. yes yes mm -hmm. so preferably not yeah right sure Okay. Okay. Any other questions, comments from commissioners? Any comments or questions from members of the public? If not, uh, there... Yeah, there, there is a hand raised. Oh, I didn't see that. Okay. Yes, Jacqueline. Uh, yes, Jacqueline McCraner, Northampton. I know nothing about wells, so I'm finding this all kind of very interesting. I'm wondering how many um, wells can be attempted to be drilled before, um, you know, moving on. It sounds like maybe after this one, the um, the plan is to talk to the neighbors below. And I'm just curious um, if there is sort of a quota of how many trials can be drilled and then what's the environmental impact of drilling wells if any uh, thank you there, as, you, as you could tell from the way this plan has been presented um yeah the, the even the temporary construction of uh the drilling would require a platform and so forth so that there's minimal environmental impact other than a temporary um impact Correct. As far as I know, in the city of Northampton, there is no constraint on the, the number of tries. Uh, oh, cool. I, <laughs> yeah, oh. I mean, at thirty thousand dollars a well, um, we really don't want to keep going. Yeah. Um, and so. it's it's also outside the conservation commission's jurisdiction. Um, this is before you because the well is proposed within Riverfront, so you're looking at for construction right. impacts. Right. But right. otherwise. Uh, Drinking water wells are regulated by the um, Department of Health and Human Services and the state DEP. I see another hand, Jackie Bounce. Um, I, I just wanted to say that I really appreciated the thoughtful discussion you all had last week. And now I'm hearing about protecting the wetlands from disturbance. and. It's just, I, it turns me on. It's really, you guys are doing a great job. That's all. <laughs> Thank you. All right. If there's no other comments, uh, motion to close the hearing. So moved. And a second. A second. Uh, and uh, it's a, and it's an RDA, so you, we can Oh, sorry. You're right. Right. It's an, an RDA. 
Not a, not a formal hearing. A request for determination of applicability. Um, so, what do you think? I'm I'm uh, comfortable given the explanation of. Uh, I, I would like to have that one uh, mountain laurel that you described scooped up, put aside, and put back. Yes. Um, but other than that, uh, I think this all sounds uh, sounds good, and I hope you don't come back before us again. Um, well, I I I will be back in the next meeting or two um, for utility uh, stuff on Turkey Hill Road. I um, see. Okay. Well, but for well purposes, I I hope this one works. <laughs> yeah, and it, yes. it seems to me this would be a clear case, even though I'm not mystical, for a water witch, a, a, a dowser <laughs> to yeah. help you hunt. Yeah, yeah. There has been that discussion for sure. Ah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, is, uh, looking back on Sarah's, we could issue a checkbox two, a negative determination that uh, it will not alter the riverfront area. Um, uh, and that one additional, besides standard, um, uh, the additional condition requiring um, uh, the, the replacement of that mountain laurel and that the sequencing of the work in the application uh, be adhered to. I think those are the two conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, someone want to make a motion to that effect? Yeah, so moved. Okay, it's second. Okay, second from Paul, uh, motion by David. Um, all in favor, Sarah? Kevin, could I ask a quick question? Sure. Sorry, um, Sarah, you mentioned shrub plantings in your um, report. Does the, just hearing about what specifically is growing and replacing that one mountain laurel address your, what you were bringing up? Yeah, I was just concerned that if it was only the, the ground cover the grass plant things that it wouldn't it wouldn't end up being revegetated but if that laurel was being um great reused then I, that covers it i think okay thank you that's cool so right. motion is motion is made and seconded uh all in favor all right so roll call vote for this one beth yes david yes jen yes paul yes and kevin yes all right unanimous thank you And now uh, we have a uh, notice of intent for construction of three single family homes on Landy Avenue. Thank uh, this you. This is a continuation from our last meeting. Hello everyone. This is uh, Ryan Nelson from Arlo Beck Associates representing the applicant New Way Homes. I'm gonna attempt to share my screen. Okay. Uh, so just a quick recap, there was a uh, formerly a single family residence on this property that was uh, has been since demoed. Um, and right now it's just a vacant grass or overgrown area. Um, applicant is looking to split the property into three and construct three separate uh, residential houses with detached garages. So this plan shown right now was what was presented at the last meeting. Um, there was various discussion from um, different parties about potential revisions. So we've addressed those revisions. And this is the revised plan shown here. And I'll walk through what has changed since then. Um, number one, primarily we shifted the garage, detached garages away from the wetlands as much as we could. Um, some of the constraints removing them any more than we have is that we still want to provide clearance between the deck and the house and the garage so that small equipment can get to the backyards to actually mow the properties. Um, so for lot one, the garage shifted maybe five feet farther away from the wetlands. Um, lot two, about the same thing. Before it was shown right on that 35 wetland buffer. Now we have about a five or six foot buffer behind that. The reason why we couldn't move it anymore once again is to provide clearance between the garage and the house for maintenance and you can see that opening is right here and then lot three we were able to move the garage substantially away probably 20 30 feet farther uh, away from the wetlands closer to the road and by doing that we uh, increased the proposed mitigation planting area at the backyard 
So we've um, added additional plantings outside or beyond that 35 foot buffer zone. Um, it's mitigation for the project. There was also concern about um, groundwater around the foundations and what would the, where would the sump pumps discharge to? So we're showing small proposed rain gardens within that mitigation planting area with uh, armored flared end outlets for the drain pipes. So there'd be one for each lot um, for those sump pump discharges. And let's see what else. Oh, um, the proposed tree plantings, red maples were uh, requested to be swapped out to a different species that wasn't uh, over planted per se within the town. So we're proposing northern catalpas for those mature trees. And lastly, uh, we added some figures to the plan showing the existing or the previous impervious surface from the former use within the wetland buffer zone. That was about 1,791 square feet. And then under the proposed project, there will be about 4,208 square feet of impervious within the wetland buffer zone. Um, our total alteration within the buffer zone on the property is 10,121 square feet approximately. And our proposed buffer zone mitigation planting area is approximately 3,980 square feet. Um, and we did add a note to the plan that the contractor slash applicant shall remove invasive plant species in accordance with applicable permit conditions prior to construction. Uh, so that's that's what has changed. Happy to answer any questions. Uh, one of the questions that I had last time was in uh, putting in full basement. Um, I when we walked the property, you could see off to the west. Um, if I apologize for my dog uh, in the background. Uh, I could see standing water in um, uh, low areas off to the west. Uh, uh, do you have a sense of where the groundwater is? And if you're putting down an eight foot uh, uh, basement, um, uh, it seems likely to me that you'll be, your sump pump will be operating all the time. I, I had asked last time if we could get an estimate of uh, flow volume um, and I don't see that anywhere. Sure, so uh, I believe the applicant John said these would be full basements. Um, groundwater was determined. We have test pits uh, in various locations in the rear portion of the property. I believe it was about 40 something inches down. Um, so those sump pumps will be discharging closer to the wetland areas. Um, I don't have any calculations on the volume that would be, that would be kind of an involved hydro analysis um, kind of not consistent with the, the scope of what John hired us for, but um, I, I don't have an accurate number of how much flow that would be. So you said the, the groundwater is 40 inches below grade at the back of the property? 14, isn't it? Uh, I can get you an exact number. Hold on, just let me pull up my sheets. Okay. Uh, groundwater was at 44 inches yeah. at three different test pit locations in the backyard area. Okay. The basements would go 96 inches deep. Yeah, so you're going to have, you're going to be constantly fighting the uh, infiltration. Wow. That's seasonal high groundwater, just to clarify. That's not standing groundwater for all times of the year. 
has estimated seasonal high based on soil modeling. I have a comment. Um, Go ahead, Paul. I know that snow removal can be tricky and it looks like there is room to accommodate it, but we haven't talked about snow melting and what kind of impact from heavy storms uh, and then um, really warm days, even in January with the snow melt, does that uh, create like a sheet flow that goes in the right direction or does that impinge on the, uh, the street and becomes a DPW problem? You know, to what extent are we passing the buck to DPW to deal with problems on the property with water? So the majority of the property, I would say from the front face, roughly or midway back on these buildings, um, is pitched towards the rear, towards the wetland. Um, the area out front by the streets, it's so flat out there. We're talking inches. Uh, the road doesn't have any drainage infrastructure. Um, it's not really any curb or any sort of defined topography between the front of these houses. Um, I, I really don't think that this sliver of proposed, you know, front yard area is going to make any neg negligible difference um, in, in snow runoff. Okay. Could you talk a little said, bit about the oh, go for it? I was just going to ask you, but that 44 inches uh, seasonal uh, groundwater level, uh, do you have an estimate for uh, how many weeks out of a year, what portion of a year it'll be at that level and what uh, what the, the I mean, uh, if, if, as you can tell, I'm trying to get a sense of if you have three basements pumping, um, uh, when the groundwater is up uh, feet above the floor of the basement, uh, you're gonna be pumping anytime the groundwater is, and I assume you're gonna do it with a, uh, a surrounding drain and then keep the uh, sump inside so it doesn't freeze. So it'll be, the water will be brought in and then pumped out. Uh, but I'm tr trying to get a sense of, oh, is this something that might happen a couple of weeks out of a year? It looked to me like it might happen most of the time. Yeah. Um, I don't have an exact duration of weeks, but I do know the um, water table elevation is cyclic. So in late winter from like February to April, it's at its peak. And then the elevation declines to a, um, you know, it's max low probably around end of August, September, and then it starts to climb again over the winter months. So I would think uh, early spring, late winter would be the highest, um, would be the peak time for groundwater level. Other questions or comments from commissioners? Could you talk a little bit more about what you were plan what's in the plan for the rain gardens? So would the sump pump be draining sort of would it be underground or would it be running above the surface? And then what is sort of the plan for the plantings or the shape or what would be happening there? Sure. So the sump pump drain would come out of the house. Um, it's dictated by a line type that's FM force main. Um, and it would be subsurface, and then it would get to a point uh, near the rain garden where it would discharge above grade at the outlets. And it's set at an elevation higher than the rim of the rain garden so that if it was to uh, fill up, it would not back backfeed into the drain and it would run off elsewhere towards the wetland, ideally. Do you, do you have an idea how much uh, uh, volume the rain garden would hold? It, it says 223 is the rim? Uh, correct. So 223 is the rim with 222 being the bottom contour. So it's about a foot deep. They're very shallow. Um, and that was due to not to interfere with, um, you know, potentially groundwater. And we didn't want to create um, too much retainage or a guest feature and have those become a wetland eventually yeah um, i don't have a, a static storage volume of those rain garden areas but they're not really uh, made to 
or designed intended to detain water for a long period of time. Uh, do you have a sense of how the infiltration rate would be? Uh, pretty good. I had, let me just pull up, um, here are the test pits for test pits two, three, and four. And uh, we observed a coarse sand as the parent material underneath. So uh, I think infiltration rates are very good. Yeah, there's a number I missed it. Um, is, it is it quantified? It's too... I don't have a drainage rate, no, but uh, based on the sand I observed, uh, infiltration is not a problem. Okay. And so I guess another set of questions about the, the rain gardens is what would you plant there or? Um, these rain gardens are fairly small, so they would be uh, planted with grass for vegetation. And we didn't show any proposed plantings within the rain garden area because of their size. And we also have many plantings around them. Um, and this area is to be, you know, left alone to revert naturally. So I would assume species would would fill in also. So, you, so you'd be talking about starting it with native grasses and then sort of seeing what what happened? Correct. Or like maintaining it actively as a rain garden? Right. There would have to be some maintenance limited to the rain garden areas just to keep things from getting clogged up. But there's no uh, proposed planting of woody plants within the rain garden area. So likely a rain garden would become um, filled with silt and, and um, become less porous, plug? Um, I th would think once the rain garden is vegetated and then it's receiving flows, there shouldn't be an influx of silt since this would be clean foundation drainage. Um, but there definitely, you know, an eye should be kept on it, especially during construction that they don't become silted. I have, I have a question. <clears throat> I know that we've received input from neighbors about the removal of, I think up to 11 mature trees. And um, there's, I guess, a plan to put uh, small saplings on the property. And I'm wondering, um, if I'm no arborist, but I'm wondering if um, a tree like a willow tree that is known for sucking up a lot of water would be um, something that'd be feasible for the rain garden. Um, I don't know how many, but it seems to me they would mitigate the, the flow of water into the area. Um, yeah, we, we have, we are showing this probably at least 40 foot corridor at the rear to be planted. So obviously all those trees will um, be having some, some water uptake. If there's specific species the commission would like, we're ha happy to accommodate those. Okay. One of the other questions that came up last time was about uh, snow removal. Uh, I'm especially struck by uh, in lot one, um, that it's hard to imagine where the snow would be put. Hmm. Uh, for lot one, depending on if the, I guess the snow removal method, if it's from the owner and they're, you know, pushing from the garage or if they're coming in from the street side, but um, it would likely have to be put over here to the south side of the garage or in the front yard area. Uh, another question, does the um, relocation of the garages do much of anything to reduce the uh, impervious areas of, of the driveways? Yes, um, let me get you those numbers. So previously, we had a proposed impervious surface within the buffer zone as 4,858. And we are now at 4,208. 
So we reduced about 600 or so square feet. Okay. In order for uh, us to permit this, we have to conclude that uh, this is a net improvement from a previous condition. Um, and I at least have uh, a lot of trouble with lot one that uh, having gone from a, and we've seen both aerial photographs and ground photographs of uh, very large trees. Um, and it would be hard for me to conclude if we were looking at this, I realized the applications came in two stages and that we permitted the removal of the trees uh, without knowing what else was going to happen. But if, uh, if I at least were looking at the before state um, with uh, uh, that row of huge trees and then the after state with this additional impervious area, it would be hard for me to conclude even with the additional plantings within the 35 foot zone uh, that this represents a net improvement. Um, yeah. I, 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 I think there's too many houses. Um, I, I, I'd like I, to clarify that, that the trees that were removed, not all of them were in the buffer zone. There were trees understand. outside the I, buffer I, zone. I, I understand. Um, and the but, previous uh, use had multiple structures, sheds, tilling going on within the 35 foot buffer. Yep, we've seen the pictures. Okay. Um, I'm just uh, sharing that we have to conclude this is this is a judgment call, and we have to conclude that this represents a net improvement from previous conditions. And I, at this point, um, especially focused on lot one, have trouble concluding that. Um, other questions, comments from commissioners. Um, I think Kevin maybe was addressing this, but I was curious. It proposed net boundary. I'm, speaking? I'm, I'm not seeing who's speaking. Uh, it's Jen, but I think she's going in and out. Okay, maybe it's just a. The mic wasn't working that well. Is that you, Jen? It was. All right. Well, um, let's hope we can get Jen back. Um, Any other questions or comments from commissioners? Well, I was kind of disturbed by the fact that we have a floodplain uh, map of from 1978. And is there anything else that we can use to understand what the uh, impact of water will be on the property in the wetlands? So th this is not within a mapped floodplain. Um, either by the definitions in the Wetlands Protection Act uh, or the, the documents that it references. So that that would address riverine flooding primarily. Oh, it doesn't okay. typically address um, urban street and, flooding, uh, but but this is not within a, a mapped floodplain. And how close is Maine's field to the property? Well, a couple hundred yards, I think. And, and that's still unusable because of water damage? That's what I understand, yes. I could imagine this property ending up in worse shape than it used to be. How would it end up in worse shape? In in the um, event of multiple storms that would overwhelm the systems in place. There are no systems in place. There's no drainage within this street. So that then becomes a DPW area of jurisdiction. 
I would assume. Also located outside the buffer zone. Yeah. Okay. Well, the, one of the differences would be is you'd be presumably pumping from the sumps into the back lot into the rain gardens. Yeah. At a pretty high rate. A, a very high rate. Good luck. There, if there I was an existing house hit there that did the same, same with all the abutting houses. Yeah, but the uh, what was the footprint of the basement? Um, I believe roughly about the same. Um, one house or all three houses together? No, just one house. Yeah, so you tripled the amount of basement space. As I said, this is one of the areas where the, the commission has to conclude that this is an improvement, and then we have to con conclude that it's uh, a significant enough improvement for us to permit um, uh, the plan. And uh, that's where there's judgment. And I'm not assuming that all of my uh, colleague commissioners uh, agree with me. I'm just saying that for me, if I think of this as it was, and I think of it as it is now, um, that uh, this the, the the density of of uh, of uh, use on this whole parcel uh, makes it hard for me to conclude this is a, a significant improvement enough to justify um, uh, allowing. I have I have a question. Um, what what part of the regulations say this has to be an improvement? I'm just curious. Oh, I'm sure Sarah knows uh, the the reference. Um, yeah, so uh, so that's our local wetlands ordinance, right? Um, so that because this is within, let me pull it here one second. Is it um, fifty feet? Yeah. So because it's within the urban residential B district, um, performance standards of the ordinance that are over and above state law are waived, except for the protected zone setback requirements. Uh, so the 35 feet is provided where development includes mitigation measure, measures that will improve the condition of the wetlands or adjacent uplands. So we're not altering the 35, but so does that, I'm just trying to think if, if this was a clean new lot and someone wanted to build in the buffer zone, they can't because it's not an improvement over existing conditions. It would depend on the application. So you uh, can build in the buffer zone or you can't? Yeah, I mean, it's case by case. So the, because this the urban residential zones are um, more densely developed and, and already developed more than outlying areas, the, the ordinance recognizes that, but there does still have to be an, an overall improvement. Okay. And just one more question. I know there's concern about the foundation drain and the sump pump. Um, and if there is an increased volume of that drainage water going to the rain garden areas, uh, how how would that be detrimental to the interests under the act? It would be a, a, a um, right now, the water that is in the ground, um, mm -hmm is going to be brought up out of the ground and pumped um, into the buffer zone and then into the wetland where it will flow into the wetland. Um, and so it'll be a, a, a net increase. A, uh, uh, how detrimental that would be, um, because we don't know the volumes, we don't know, um, it's hard to say, uh, but we have to be convinced that uh, there's a net improvement uh, significant enough um, to justify the plan. If I may, you may say something. Uh, who's that? Uh, John Hans, I'm the applicant. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I think it's way more, way too much um, to being put into the fact of the water being brought up. 
I built on several locations like this. And with the way we build, we keep the foundation elevated as much as possible, not to mention the drains we use around it. And any water that does come up, because we want as little as possible, is going to be put back right to where it was. So it's not going to be a detriment whatsoever as far as, you know, and like I said, we build it so the fact is that by raising the foundation as much as possible, you're not sinking it into the ground where you're going to have the problems. So, and the way that we do all the stone around the foundation and everything else, I don't think it's going to be that much brought up. And when you get to lot one with the snow removal, we haven't had snow in how many years? We have snow one day, then we have a puddle the next day. Um, I think some things are being dwelled on more than it's really required, in my opinion. Thank you. I, pre I appreciate your opinion. And uh, uh, this is a uh, a stepwise process. And if it were to be, and I'm not, I have no idea how the rest of my colleagues feel. Um, but if it were to be denied, you have the right to appeal. So. Uh, uh, but all we have to do at this point is is uh, exercise our best judgment. Um, well, look, that's I understand your you know I understand where you're coming from. If you think uh, you know if they need to be put on slabs, we can do it on slabs. The point is we don't want to, but we can do it. You know anything that's going to suit. If you think two houses need to be on foundations and one can't, well, the third will be on a slab. We can uh, we're we're here we're here to work with you. Well, and we 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 try to avoid re-engineering applications. Um, that can be quite a a, a rabbit hole um, that we like to avoid. So we can only assess what the uh, applicant has put before us. Well, Are there like other said, questions or comments from commissioners? Can you hear me more clearly now, Kevin? Yes. Hi, Jen. Yes. Okay. Um, my internet is obviously being funky, so forgive me if this has been asked and just tell me and we can move on. But I'm, and this is a little maybe irrelevant at this stage, but I'm just curious if there's any proposed permanent boundary between those um, buffer plantings and what seems to me to be very small lawn areas because it seems like lawn encroachment could be a real issue down the road since these are small lots we don't yeah, have anything the, shown demarcating that, that but we're happy to accommodate or put markers or boulders or boundaries whatever the commission feels is appropriate birdhouses posts Right. I think we discussed at the prior meeting that uh, uh, some kind of um, boulders or something that prevents people, because otherwise, um, even if not the first buyer, a subsequent owner might just say, oh, well, you know, let's, let's mow all the way back to the property line. Um, and uh, we've had things like that happen before and right. have uh, concluded that bollards or boulders that can prevent um, uh, mowing are uh, the only way we found that actually works. So yes, that would be a condition that would be required. Other questions or comments from commissioners? And uh, I, then I'll go ahead. I do have sort of a logistical question for Sarah, if this is the right time. Sure. Um, I, and maybe I should know this, but I felt a little confused about how to consider this as one parcel with the previous use versus three individual parcels and kind of looking at the impervious surface and improvements on these individual parcels proportionally versus this as one unit. So I just want to know the correct way to sort of be considering this. Yeah, so it, it's being presented as, as a single development. Um, it, it did actually come in initially from the applicant as three separate applications, but it, it seemed impossible for the commission to be able to consider the cumulative impacts of a, of a single development proposal that way. So you're looking at the whole thing. Okay, that's super helpful. Thank you. I, I have a question. 
do we know well, enough? Do we know enough about the status of the land uh, from the the previous owner to be able to assert that this is definitely an improvement? That the lot's been cleaned up, the water is being properly directed, and that um, compared to the way it used to be, this is a, in some ways a much more manageable situation. I just don't know what to compare this to in terms of previous use. So the previous use was um, a house that was located down here more towards lot three. Right. There right. was a garage right here, right near the, the fence of yep. the, the property. There was sheds, gardens. Um, and then there was also a, a ton of junk. The house was falling down hmm. yeah, and probably attest to what he pulled out of there. Um, and, you know, our opinion, this is a, a much cleaner, green, natural buffer hugging the wetlands where it matters most. Yeah. Okay. If there are, uh, well, let me, are there any other questions from commissioners? If not, I'll uh, take Sorry, comments. can I ask one more question really quick? Sure. Um. So you mentioned the invasive species management. Um. What What kind of methods would you use? Um. In In that sort of wetland area to manage the invasive species. So the wetlands are off site on property that the applicant doesn't own. So we would not be doing any work within the wetland, but within the previously yeah. cleared portion of the property, um, any invasives that would be identified would be cut and removed off-site properly and then likely the the roots would be dug out um since this area needs to be reworked anyway okay anything else from commissioners i'm wondering if an arborist could be um consulted about the most um, water absorbing types of uh, tree species that could be planted there. We could certainly make that a condition if we were to permit this. I think I would support that idea. Another idea is we could make the rain gardens within this planted mitigation area larger too, if that uh, satisfies some of the worries the commission has. Hmm. Anything else from commissioners? If not, I'll turn to members of the public and I see several hands up on my screen. I can't tell the order in which they were um, raised. So I'll just call them from top to bottom on my screen. There's a Joe M. Hi, um, I live up the street from the uh, proposed Can you state lot. Your last name, please? Oh, I'm Joe Maribel. Okay. And sorry. Um, mm -hmm. And I live up the street. And I got a few things to say because I actually got to run in about uh, four minutes. Uh, there is uh, drainage uh, things in front of my house and my neighbors across the street. And when it rains and it gets really hard, it starts to overflow. And unfortunately, their lot gets a lot more of the water poured onto them than my property. My foundation is higher, and I still have to have a sub pump running at the times. Um, and my neighbor across the street has a sub pump running at times too to get rid of some of this water. And so my question was going to be is if you did put three sub pumps in this property and it's sloping to the wetlands on the back, is that where you're going to be pumping it to and how that would affect the eventual flow down towards Maine's field, which also I might add is still under construction trying to rebuild it. I think that uh, uh, the the plan is yes, indeed, 
to have the pumps uh, uh, at their, in, on the drawing that shows flared openings uh, back in the buffer zone um, heading toward the wetland. Uh, but as, as of yet, we don't have any calculations about volume and we don't know therefore any impact on surrounding areas. So you wouldn't know the impact of as far as the parking lot that goes to the uh, used to be medical center. There's a veterinarian in there as well. Uh, I, I, nobody has it. We don't know the volume, so we don't know what incremental impact there might be. Okay. All right. And I thank you for inviting us here, but I unfortunately have to run. Okay. Thanks for your comments. All right. I'll go next. Uh, Jacqueline. Hi, thank you. Um, Jacqueline McCraner. I live in Northampton. Uh, I take a different approach from the developer. As a resident, I'm quite concerned about the city's approach to dealing with stormwater and, and mature trees, which I think mitigate stormwater and are not uh, valued enough for their ability to do so. Um, with climate change, we're just going to see more water, uh, more rainfall, not less. And I guess my my three, I have questions and, and comments about this project in particular. Uh, is there a dewatering process that's going to occur during construction? And if yes, what is that dewatering process? And then... Um, I was attending a city council meeting the other day, and it was with budget hearings where Donna Lascalia, the director of the DPW, was talking about how um, with our warmer winters and less snowfall, uh, we're actually seeing a lot more rain going to freezing rain, going to ice, back to freezing rain, then rain, then back to freezing rain and ice, etc. And in that case, um, a lot more salt is being used. So uh, with these driveways pitching back towards the wetlands, I'm curious about de-icing that's going to be used, de-icing products, salt products, that could wind up in the wetlands and also um, even lawn care and pesticides and lawn care products, but particularly the, the de-icing and salt minerals. So I have a question about dewatering and and salt and, and lawn care products. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I can say that in other cases, we have sometimes re required uh, an operating and maintenance uh, plan uh, that uh, precludes the use of uh, of uh, road salt on uh, properties. Uh, we haven't discussed that yet on this case, but uh, we have done that in the past. As to dewatering, I assume you're asking about uh, during the excavation process. Um, if uh, 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 which, if if there's going to be a uh, an eight foot um, uh, excavation and you have 44 inches of, of ground below grade groundwater. Uh, uh, that's a, an interesting question. I know that hasn't been addressed, but um, I will uh, let's let's get other people's comments first and then I'll ask the applicant to address that one. Um, what how the construction of the uh, excavating for for the basements uh, would take place given the groundwater, would be um, flowing into the hole as you dig it. So I'll ask that, but let's go to other people's comments first. Uh, Jackie Valance. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at this site plan and it looks so familiar. Before I get into my personal story, I just want to say that with climate change affecting insurance rates because we've had six billion dollar climate catastrophes just this year and it's only may in this country so flood insurance is going to be, be very pricey for these homes i imagine 
and I'd be curious to to know what what that figure might be. Meanwhile, I have to ask you to keep your comments to things that are within our purview, and uh, yes, home thank, insurance okay. is not one of them. Okay, it's a thank you. I I live downhill from the intersection of Warner Street and Hinkley, just the other side of the drum one known as Baker Hill from Landy Ave. And at the corner uphill from me, Mr. Hansel demolished an old house, built, to, to subdivided the lot very similarly, put in three houses where there used to be one, took down the trees, and I look downhill from that, and every time it rains like it rained yesterday, I have a river. Warner Street becomes a river from gutter to gutter. And I'm the wetlands from my house is still a couple blocks downhill. I don't think I don't think it's going to work. Just based on my own experience of flooding on Warner Street. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Diane Scott. Hi. My name is Diane Scott. I live at 44 Landy Avenue, which is across the street from 39 Landy Avenue. Um, I was at the previous meeting, and um, first off, I'm glad to hear concern on the commission's part about the impact that this is going to have, this project, because I feel like it's going to be dire. Um, I want to first speak to the fact that no one, um, neither the builder nor uh, his architect or whatever role Ryan plays in this, I'm not sure, um, I saw this property before the owner was in a long-term care facility with the complete loss of her mind. She lived here for several years, unable to care for the property, and those of us helped her as best we could. But it is not fair to judge the condition of the property when he bought it by what it had been like for the hundred years before that or since the 1930s. Um, so I just want to say that, that uh, that was always very, very well cared for. Um, and and used property. He had fruit trees. I've said this before. He had fruit trees. He had ornamental bushes. He had a beautiful wisteria vine. There was many beautiful water soaking up plantings. And um, the uh, so that said, I want to move on to um, at, at an earlier meeting. It was said by the builder that he would be changing the great because of the water problem that he would be changing the grade of the property to allow for getting the basements up above where that would be a problem and nowhere in the in the plans does it show any difference in grade of the new there's no topographical information that shows what the grade would be changed to or from um and so i'm curious about that and in the project narrative in section three it's page two under the project description, it still states that low profile dry wells are proposed. And I believe that that was one of the things that was was not um, not okay by the commission. And um, so I'm concerned, I'm concerned about that, that the project still says that in it. Um, the, uh, da, 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 it still shows the drainage plug on the Southwest boundary of the property and my fear is that if some pumps are pumped into the into the wetland which i believe they're going to run from the houses into the rain drains or into the um rain gardens and into the wetland it's going to overwhelm that pipe more than it already is and that water is going to come across the street and go hopefully under my back porch without a problem um but if that pipe fails that's a problem on my property as it makes its way to the wetland that is behind my house, much bigger wetland. Um, I'm still concerned about that. I'm very, uh, I was disappointed in the amount of changes you, you asked the um, builder to reconsider some of the plantings and things. And so the, the and I thought that you wanted something a little bit more major. Um, the only changes were that two trees were changed in variety, not size. So they'll start out, they might grow a little bigger, but they're not going to grow faster, bigger. And um, there was only a difference in, uh, so no no increased number of trees and they were only minimally changed where they were planted. And the only thing added were eight more shrubs. And again, shrubs aren't trees. 
and I don't know how much water mitigation they do. And that is that is assuming that they all live and we can't we can't know that the builder is going to be around to make sure that they are taken care of. Um, I think my, my brain is overwhelmed, but um, I'm very happy to hear that there's concern on the committee's part that this, oh, the lot one, the lot one, the lot one property line, there's a zero place. There's, a, there's currently a chain link fence that belongs to the um, John Hansel. It's on his property, it was there. And the, according to the plans, the paved driveway will abut that fence. We didn't have much snow last year, but the year before we had, I snow blow my friend's driveway. And I know that many times I got that snow blower out and used it. I have grave concerns of where that snow is gonna go. We can't put it into the street. And it's a long way from the road to the back of the house, to in front of the garage, to out into the area where the lawn is, where the rain garden is and all of the other all of the other buffer zones. So um, I'm concerned. I would hope that the commission backs this whole project back, back to the two houses that were proposed at some point. That was one of the proposals that was put forth. And that seemed like a much more reasonable, probably less profitable, but far less, um, would far less negatively impact um, our neighborhood. And uh, that's what my concern is. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Nan S. Hi, Nancy Smith, uh, Chapel Street. I uh, just want to really thank the commission for the thoughtful questions um, that you're asking. Um, not an expert at this, but one of the questions that was asked is when the water gets pumped out of one house, where does it go? There are three um, uh, houses on Laurel Street right next to me. One one will pump out their basement. But they finish, it ends up in the neighbor's house. They pump it out, it ends up back there. So these are good questions. People have been living with this for a long time. Uh, another uh, point is, um, there, I believe a Hansel um, house on the corner of um, Rust and Chapel. And I have to say it's beautiful and far beyond the hot mess that was there before they had to be torn down. So the house is nice but we ended up with water problems and the DPW did step in to help uh, the gentleman whose basement was flooding. And uh, unfortunately, um, we didn't realize it, but it was the water was flowing into our property, the condo uh, across the street that um, borders the wetlands and uh, patio bricks were actually washing out. Like we didn't know where they were. The woman's patio block was just gone. It would just drop through. There was so much water. So they did get that straightened out, but getting these things done, and we actually paid a lot of money to have people come in. We thought it was animals. Having these things done in advance are so important. And I'm sure this is a hassle for Mr. Hansel, and if, uh, but um, it really is important to get it done right. And the house of the corner of Chapel and Rust is way better than what was there before. So thank you to the commission, appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, Deborah. Hey, um, my name is Deborah. Um, and so I abutted that property for 16 years. And one of the things that the commission is able to do in terms of delaying or denying is to get more information. And I did not say this in the last hearing, but there's um, one, you know, the one thing that we know is that mature trees, as many people have said, absorb water and we have the only other mature trees really left at the well I no longer I, I sold the property this past year um, there are many mature ash trees at the rear of the property that also kind of abut the that <laughs> that the rest of, they're absorbing the rest of what's going on in the wetland and they've been dying for the last maybe eight years and they're going to be gone in not too long and I think it would behoove somebody to go look at them and assess the health of them because once those are gone there's going to be much more of a water problem the other thing is that um, I'm going to reiterate that the uh, one of the advantages of Mr. Hansel having done a number of developments is that we can look at what's happened with them. And we have two on our street that have had a lot of water problems. The same things I've called the DPW. I've called the city to say the bank in front of my house is being washed away. We have water pouring down the street. We have storm drains overflowing. Exact same plan. Trees torn down, you know, trees taken up and 
and they're not being proper water mitigation systems recognizing the impact of multiple houses on a lot where there had been one. Um, and then the last thing I just want to say, which I just feel it's important to know in terms of fact and the question about improvement is that I have restored many houses over the years. It is not an incredibly profitable operation. It is nothing like the potential of these houses, but that house was in perfectly fine shape. And uh, and it was only not in fine shape after the windows were left open for you know close to a year before it was demolished. But um, so so it's disingenuous to suggest that it needed to be torn down or that the trees needed to come down because they were unhealthy. It wasn't profitable. I mean, there's a different plan for the property, but but we should all be honest that this is just a, a different choice about how to move forward with the development. Let's, let's yeah. not uh, imply that anybody's being dishonest. We're just trying to deal with the information that we have. But yeah. thank you. So I'll just say it was, it was inaccurate to say that the house was a wreck and needed to be torn down. That's not accurate. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Well, anybody else who hasn't spoken? Um, so go back uh, and ask the applicant uh, the dewatering question during construction. If you have uh, water levels 44 inches below grade and you're digging down eight feet, you're going to be uh, digging in a lot of water. I uh, hadn't thought about a dewatering process. Uh, how would you be dealing with that? So any dewatering would follow typical best management practices. Um, whether that's a stilling basin or a silt sock on a trash pump, that would all, you know, if needed, be discharged within the approved limit of work. Um, and I want to make the parties here aware that when we identified groundwater at 44 inches down, that's not sitting standing groundwater like a water table. That's evidence of modeling or weeping um, through the soil. So the water table is not sitting at that elevation at a constant duration throughout throughout the year. Um, also, uh, you know, the dewatering, that's not, this isn't something unique to this site. Dewatering occurs on many, many, many a high percentage of construction projects within the New England area. Um, so this is something that's not new or rare to this particular project. Um, like I said, it would follow best management practices um, within the limit of work. Thank you. And um, there was a question also about uh, a grade change. And I, as I recall, there was never going to be a substantial grade change. There was just going to be um, uh, around the 100 uh, foot buffer. Uh, ballpark that just to encourage uh, flow to the west, um, but not any significant grade changes. Is, is my memory accurate about that? That's correct. So to answer the question for the abutters concern, the gray, gray tone dashed contour lines are existing. The solid, darker contour lines are proposed. So we do show existing and proposed contours. And I'm uh, trying to read that, but I see uh, 224, uh, 224, 224. I uh, see 223 further back with the edge of the rain garden, but uh, not, it seems like there's not much more than a foot anywhere um, from correct. the front to the back. Okay. That's correct. All right. Um, any other questions, comments uh, from commissioners before we close the hearing? Yeah, I guess I just wanted to get a clarification on that. When you had the 44 inches you were talking about, um, that's 44 inches down to, not to the groundwater, but to the saturated zone, but to some level of soil moisture. I, I, I'm not quite, I don't quite understand what that number means. Sure. Um, so when evaluating groundwater elevations for stormwater purposes or drainage or construction like this. And uh, this is consistent with how perk tests are done um, and stormwater basins under the Mass DP handbook for stormwater. You are looking for and recording the estimated seasonal high groundwater. 
So the highest point at which groundwater reaches within that soil column. Um, so that mm -hmm. is what 44 inches was identified as. So that's the maximum peak during some time in late spring, uh, sorry, late winter, early spring, but the groundwater elevation fluctuates throughout the year based on, um, you know, rain events and, uh, you know. Right, right, but that 44 inches is the, is indeed the maximum level for the saturated zone capillary correct. fringe. Yes, correct. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from commissioners before we close the hearing? And just make sure before you you do close that you um, you don't feel that you need any additional information that couldn't potentially be addressed. Yeah, I guess that's the thank you, sir. That uh, uh, are, are there other questions of the applicant, or uh, I suppose we could continue again and ask the applicant to go uh, get additional information if uh, they're not ready to ask or answer those questions today. Uh, but are there any additional information we need, uh, as Sarah correctly points out, we don't want to close the hearing um, until we have all the stuff that we uh, want to know. In order Kevin, to do you want numbers deliberate. about the volume of water flow? Um, I heard the uh, uh, applicant say that that would be quite an involved calculation. I, uh, it's an important factor for me um, uh, and the absence of having that information does play a role in in my judgment um, but, and would that uh, require the retaining of a hydrologist so to answer that there are far too many variables to give an accurate number um you know we just saw last this past march was the what second or third west march in history with nine inches of rain um we can't I, foresee those things or dry spells, the rainfall amount varies year to year, month to month. So to estimate a rainfall or determine the soil connectivity around the houses, there's there's, there's too many variables to assume. And let's just say we do run a calculation like that and we determine a CFS flow out of these um, these sump pump drain lines. I mean, what what does that arbitrary number mean to the commission and to myself? If it was 200 CFS versus eight, I yeah. I really yeah. don't know how to evaluate that. Yeah. Okay. Ryan, what what's the size of the uh, of the connection and the outlet to the rain garden? Uh, usual foundation drainage is minimum four inch. In these cases, probably would be four inches diameter. Maybe six, depending how belts and suspenders John wanted to be. But uh, can I ask you, you do have, you say the, you don't think the, the number of cubic feet per second flow would be too meaningful to us, but you do have those numbers. Did you provide them? Uh, we do not have those numbers, no. Oh, okay. And I just want to offer to the commission if it some of these concerns are alleviated uh, by additional revisions, we're willing to uh, increase the area and detainment size of the rain garden, as well as planting additional trees. I have a question as to um, whether the houses are going to have French drain pipes as a first line of defense before the sump pump has to kick in. Uh, so those would be required in tandem. So there would be uh, curtain drain or French drain around the foundation of the house. Yes. Okay. So, commissioners, is there any additional information we need, or are we uh, ready to close the hearing? Kevin, I would like to have a better understanding of the species of trees and the size um, of trees, their calipers, um, that would be most water absorbent. 
that's been a consistent theme brought up by um, the public. And it seems to make sense to me. I don't know if that would require an order of condition uh, asking or uh, uh, necessitating the consultative services of an arborist. Um, I think that yes, uh, we could make that uh, a part of the order of conditions um, if we were of the opinion, relatively confident opinion, um, that there would be an answer that would allow us to say yes to this project. That there are um, big absorbent transpirational um, uh, trees that would lead us to say, oh, okay, good, uh, that'll work. Um, so if if that uh, that's usually the basis on which we make special conditions is that we think okay if if this were in place that would be good. And it would be hard to match the eleven trees that are gone, and that to me is the the technical challenge is to find something um, reasonably comparable to that absorption capacity. Um, yes, I, I and I I don't know whether <laughs> whether uh, that's an answerable question or what kind of training would be necessary to properly answer it. Uh, yeah. it uh, certainly, something that we could um, ask them to, to explore. But at this point, I I don't know. I don't know whether that's a. Uh, um, and, and I realize I'm I'm editing my own thoughts. <laughs> my, my 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 I continue to to think that uh, there's too much impervious surface. There's uh, three is too many uh, foundations. Uh, that that a lot one garage uh, and the, the the drive along the property line that all of that strikes me as, no, nope, it's hard for me to get to a point where I feel like this represents an improvement over prior conditions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so uh, at this point, I don't think we, from my perspective, I don't think the concerns that I have uh, can be addressed by order, an order of special conditions that we would put in an order of conditions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. So I, I, I don't know how anybody else on the commission is feeling because we, are prohibited from deliberating other than in these open public hearings. So I don't know what anybody else's thoughts are. But, uh, I would are my... say, I would say, Kevin, I'm in the same place. My highest concern is the level of the increase in impervious surface. And I think I have other questions, but they're all sort of below that, like that. I don't think most of the answers would answer that question for me in terms of an improvement. Um, so at least personally, I'm ready to close, but happy to wait for everybody to be ready. Yeah, for, for me, I, I don't feel like it's a information. I, I, there's not like necessarily more information that I need. I guess like the way I'm feeling about it is that the making the permanent buffer zone um, native plants, if that was truly restored, I think that that would be really positive. But whether that would outweigh the increase in pervious surfaces is the thing that I'm struggling with because I would like it would be great to have that restoration, but it would be easier if there was a little bit less development of the remaining parts of the property. I understand. Yes. Um, that's part of the judgment call that I was talking about earlier that uh, we have to decide it's a significant enough improvement to justify the project as proposed. So if lot one was not built, that would uh, give us an increase of 900 permeable square feet? Uh, at least, because there's also the drive and the garage. Uh, so yes, it would, it would have a substantial impact. Yeah. That's not something we could do on an order of conditions. That's something yeah. the applicant would have to come back with a new yeah. application. Right. So what do you think? More information or motion to close? Well, the, 
the information that I'm interested in, I don't think is available right now. And that is, um, I'm, I'm still troubled by the possibility that at the high groundwater levels, uh, the sump flow, whatever that is in CFS, is going to overwhelm the um, infiltration rate for the rain gardens. Yes. The, the applicant did say that he would be willing to build these on slab. So if there's, if that is a change the commission thinks is important, we would be happy to continue and come back with a revised plan. That uh, does address uh, part of the uh, sump pump volume question. It doesn't address the impervious surface question. So from 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 my perspective, uh, uh, given my concerns, um, that that would be that would represent an improvement, but not an improvement of the sort that I'd be looking for. I think the imperfect surface question is, uh, and the removal of the uh, trees and the, the the just the cramming as much as is possible into this area, just right outside of the protected zone. Uh, I still don't feel comfortable with. I would agree no. with that. I would so agree with my, that, Kevin. So my inclination would be uh, to close the hearing. Vote. I like I say. I don't know how how many people will be uh, uh, agreeing with me. Uh, it may be that we will uh, permit this, and then we can in the closed hearing uh, discuss uh, what the conditions would be. Um, but the alternative would be if we uh, deny the, the, the permit at this point that the applicant could uh, either appeal as is or come back with an alternative application. I have uh, one last question. Yes. Is the improvement over existing conditions, does in this case apply to the whole buffer zone or just the 50 foot protected zone? The, um, the, how I'm thinking about it is the, uh, both the protected zone and the uh, adjoining upland um, in this proposal uh, are things that, there isn't a magic line um, at 35 feet. Uh, so what happens in the rest of the area in terms of impervious surface uh, does- uh, Right, in, in I understood. Term. I'm just struggling to grasp where in the regulations it says that outer buffer zone has to be an improvement over existing conditions. So, so it's, in, it's in the protected zone setback, Ryan. So a okay. reduced setback of 35 feet is permitted where development includes mitigation measures that will improve the existing condition of the wellands or adjacent upland. All right, thank you. So if we were to pull the garages outside of the 50, then we no longer have to meet an improvement over existing conditions, correct? If, if you're not seeking the 35 foot um, reduced protected zone uh, and, and you're pulling everything out beyond the 50 feet, then, then that wouldn't apply. Okay. In that case, um, I'd like to request a continuance so we could evaluate those alternatives. All right. Um... If the uh, applicant desires a continuance, um, we almost invariably say, okay, um, how much time do you need? Um, your next scheduled meeting would be fine. Uh, so neither Carolyn or I are available, unfortunately, on May 23rd. So the, the next commission meeting will be June 13th. Okay. It's fine. When's that, Sarah? June 15th? J uh, June 13th. So 13. that's the first scheduled meeting in June. All right, someone want to make a motion to continue this case to the 13th of June? So moved. At 5.30, presumably, Sarah, first up? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Paul moved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, made and seconded. Uh, if not any further discussion, then all in favor? Sarah? All right, so roll call. Beth? Yes. David? Yes. Jen? Yes. Paul? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. All right. Thank you. This is uh, 
not a not a simple one. Okay, thanks. Uh, we'll get back to you with an updated plan, and we'll uh, chat with Sarah. Thanks. Thanks. Very good. Thank you. Um, request for determination of applicability to determine if grading related to pickleball court construction is subject to the Wetlands Protection Act or the Wetlands Ordinance. This at Ellerbrook Field. Uh, who's here to speak to that? Hi. Um, I'm Michael Liu with the Berkshire Design Group. Um, uh, Anne Marie Mogio, which most of you probably know, she is um, not available tonight. Otherwise, she'd be here too. Uh, so I'm going to present the um, pickleball project um, off Burt's Pit Road at uh, Ray Ellerbrook Field. Um, let me try to get my screen up. All right. Whoops. Are you seeing the survey plan? Yes. Okay. Yep. Yes. Um, so this is the survey uh, that we did. Um, Ray Ellerbrook Field is right here. Burt's Pit Road is to the north. This um, red rectangle represents the edge of the court pavement. The existing gravel drive comes in, and this area is all gravel parking, and which extends down to here. Um, this line right here with the little uh, boxes represents the uh, existing wood guardrail. So the extent of the paving is extending um, a little bit beyond the edges of the uh, the gravel area. Wetlands were flagged offsite um, in the um, on the state hospital property. Uh, the 100 foot buffer line is shown right here. And part just a little whoops, little piece of the court is extending into the um, 100 foot buffer zone as well as um, some of the uh, grading for the side slopes. And that's shown here in this demolition plan. Um, we're proposing erosion control all along the downhill um, east and east and west um, sides of the um, uh, disturbed area. Uh, I'm going to jump right to the grading plan. This is the layout plan just showing the, the court area, the fencing, um, and dimensions. Overall, I should say it mentioned that the uh, paving area is 200 feet total length by 76 feet in width. Um, on the grading plan, let me try to zoom in a bit here. Where's my zoom? Oh. On the bottom right. Oh, I, okay. yeah, sorry. It's cover, cover, um, all your great little camera photos are covering everything up for me. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I'll, I'll just use this. So the grading plan, um, what we're doing this, the, the courts basically slope from North to South and along the South side, we're showing a swale. Originally we had this swale kind of just blending into this existing, um, swale that, uh, discharges down, you know, further South of the site. Um, we did meet with Doug McDonald and he asked if we could, um, do a couple of things. One was, um, uh, enclose the swale. So there's somewhat of a basin, if you will. So that would slow down the water and allow it to infiltrate. We do have pretty good soils here at this site. They're pretty sandy, it turns out. And if this thing fills up, you know, with, um, roughly, I think it's about nine inches of water, it would overtop, uh, right here and continue down the swale. I think what we're gonna do is add a little, uh, protect this overflow with some riprap stone just to keep it from eroding, which that was a really good idea. Um, we also added a small little depression here off to the uh, east, I mean, the west of the parking spaces. This is still gravel area and um, the regrading of this area is, ca is um, causing water to flow away from this curb line. But if any water were to, you know, get off of the gravel and into this kind of grass area, it would be caught in a, a real shallow little bowl here and uh, just to slow it down uh, before it, you know, would um, flow it into the 100 foot buffer zone, which is right here. Um, so again, this um, hatched red area represents the disturbed, uh, the disturbance in the 100 foot yeah. buffer zone, which is yeah. about 580 square feet. So um, basically we're asking for a negative determination um, and contend that this 
uh, project won't have an, any adverse impact on um, resource areas. Um, I think that's kind of a quick summary of the project and entertain any comments or questions. Uh, the one question, and I, I think I know the answer because <clears throat> I was on the Community Preservation Committee when this <clears throat> came for funding before us, and I asked, why can't you shift it just a couple of feet east and then you wouldn't have this corner hanging out there? For it, there's a couple things in play here. One, <laughs> one is um, we're about 12 to 15 feet from the back of this um, existing bleacher on, and concrete pad. So, you know, this is getting, a, you know, a little close to the so existing softball field, which exists. But the other issue is there's this existing manhole here. Well, actually, there's a there's a bunch of catch basins and drain piping, and we're removing them all except this one structure. And that's because the piping network runs from this manhole in the parking lot through this other structure, and then it discharges down here south, you know, off off of the um, the image. So, you know, we have to maintain that outlet. Um, and we we're actually looking at, you know, I'm, I I need to talk to Anne Marie about this, like like doing an an, um, an alternate where we take this structure out and just and the piping and then just try to run a straight line, you know, that discharges down here. Um, the inverts don't quite work because the invert out of this structure is really low, so we'd be chasing grade all the way down to almost where this existing pipe discharges. So that's a lot of work. It's it's just not in the budget to to do. To, to take all that out and then basically replace it with a new line. And, the, and I'll get back to the structure. Uh, the proposal is to um, keep the existing rim buried, but, you know, replace the frames with a, with a type of, a, um, I call it a pave over grate or a pave over frame where, you know, it's got, it's inset. You can get, you can put, um, it's typically used for like, you know, brick pavers or something. And, the the idea is that you know we just you know fill it with the asphalt and and the court coloring. I I personally do have some concerns about that because I think that that eventually is going to loosen up, if you will. It's just not. It's just in a very inconvenient location with respect to where pickleball player the players are spending most of the activity, which is you know basically right in this zone. I I would love to eliminate it and get rid of it. Get you know. From under the court area but right now um there's no money to there's no extra money i should say um so maybe we can do it as an ad alternate uh, but ultimately if this structure stays we certainly don't want it within the court area right, but right, i right. personally i think it's just as bad being two feet off of the of, of the um sidelines so if we can get rid of it we will um, but that would only allow us to shift this thing over maybe, you know, three feet or so, um, I think. And we could probably just get this corner on that 100 foot line. It's does it really make a difference? I guess that's up to you. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's it's a, I think it's a minimal amount We're we're trying to get the all the runoff from the paved area to flow in a westerly direction rather than, you know, over um, in an easterly direction. Yeah. So it at least has a chance to flow away, infiltrate, and then, you know, run off into the wood existing uh, woods where, you know, it's well um, vegetated and, you know, won't, won't be um, causing any erosion. Yeah. And I would add too, that at a, at a site visit, um, it was pretty obvious that although there's this stormwater system in place, a lot of the, the runoff from the parking lot is currently just sheet flowing to these two catch basins. So if we're getting a, a good size storm, um, that gravel material is mobilizing and entering the stormwater system, and this will stop that activity. Yeah, yeah. Right now, the ex in the existing conditions, there's catch basins off of the edge of the gravel in, in isolated low spots. How effective those are, I can't really say. They were put in a long time ago. This, this, you know, it would really be better if the if the parking area could be paved, where you know you could control the flow, where the gravel's not moving, and um, and so forth. So, but um, you know, that's maybe um, hopefully money for another day. Right. Well, I'm, I'm uh, given, and I. I've, I've been out there, so I know 
where this is and what it looks like. And um, given the little encroachment uh, into 100, I think there's there's no magic that if it were three feet east, it would then somehow be much better. So I just wanted to ask the question because that's a, the obvious one that comes up when you look, why are you, why, you got that far, why not move it a little? But I, I, I knew there, there were complicating factors, yeah. as you pointed out. There, yeah, there always are, um, yeah. But, um, you know, we're going to work on it. And if we can improve it, um, for instance, if if suddenly Emory decides that there's, you know, $50,000 the extra somewhere, you know, hell, heck, you know, we'll, we'll, I'd love to get rid of that structure and, you know, yeah. off of the court area. Well, the community preservation gave you a good chunk of money for this purpose and left the rest to fundraising by, this was, I have to say, one of the most enthusiastic community um, support i would uh, think so yeah just hundreds of people um wrote letters and, and phone calls and showed up on zoom and so forth so it was uh who knew i mean i've never played pickleball but apparently yeah. people who do right. are really enthusiastic about it so yeah 38, yeah. 38 million americans <laughs> it's really? um yeah it's every community is looking for places to you know add pickleball yeah. these days and uh it's yeah. a, a hot new um game and you know i think that's great and this is a good location because uh, I, I, with the complaints I hear, is that it's quite loud. The yeah, way the ball right, hits the racket right. is quite loud. So this yeah. isn't going to bother anybody. <laughs> that's, that's any other true. comments, questions from commissioners? No. Sorry if I missed this. Is there a fence? Do pick, I don't never played pickleball. Are pickleballs going to end up? Um... In the wetland? <laughs> no, there's um so the 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 um court is surrounded by an eight foot tall fence. I'm told that rarely do pickleballs fly over an eight foot fence. <laughs> oh. Um and then in between the courts, these lines represent four foot divider um fencing. So you know you can somewhat isolate the, the courts and prevent balls from you know going back and forth. But um, yeah, you're right. It, it is loud. You you know you've probably all seen videos of pickleball you know action and that sound. Um, it's worse than it. It's louder than a tennis ball for sure. You know. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Any other questions, comments? All right. Well, this is a. Uh, um... an RDA, so we don't need to close the hearing. Um, and I'm just looking back on Sarah's. If the commission agrees that this grading will not alter the resource area, you can issue a negative determination by checking box three. Um, looks to me like this is being carefully thought out and um, willing to uh, say, yeah, understandable. Um, uh, hopefully you can come up with the money to get the <laughs> The, the complete uh, drainage structure done the way you'd like it, but uh, as it is, seems like you know, that little corner being inside the uh, officially jurisdictional area doesn't bother me. So um, yeah. I'm happy to happy to say good luck. I hope it goes well. Uh, so someone want to make a motion to grant uh, uh, or to a uh, issue a negative determination in checkbox three. I can make that motion. And a second. second. Made and seconded. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor? Sarah? All oh, right. So roll call vote. Oh, Beth? Yes. David? Yes. Jen? Yes. Paul? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. All right. Unanimous. Thank you. Well, great. Thank you very much and have a great night. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Um, and last we have. Uh, Oh, no, we have two things. That one is going to be a continuation. Uh, notice of intent for a walkway deck and landscaping within the riverfront area at 60 Federal Street. Uh, the applicant has requested a continuance. And, and I'd written 530 on the um, on the staff report, but given that we've just continued something to 530, let's do six. Six o'clock, OK. Um, we do, we and... do need to a move second and roll call for the continuation. Um, 
And so we got two other items. Uh, one is uh, a certificate of compliance request for 17 Spring Street. Sarah sent us some information about that, but is there a presentation or somebody here representing? Yeah, uh, Louis Hasbrook is here. Okay. Talk Hi, I'm Louis Hasbrook representing the Elks. Um, and I, uh, I'm not very good at presentations. I'm pretty good at listening to them, but I've not done many. I think the cover letter best sums the uh, situation. The Elks were, was constructed in 2002. Since the site was in is in the Mill River flood zone, the lodge substituted a notice of intent and request for determination. Mission issued an order of conditions in February of 02. There's no records that the lodge ever filed for a request for a certificate of compliance. And much of the information is is lost to history. What we've done is gone back over um, the um original order of conditions, um, gotten a, a new um, as-built survey, had, had an engineer compare the as-built survey with the plan survey to determine that there was a foot-for-foot -foot compensatory storage system. We've gone down the 18 separate conditions that were in attachment B for the order of conditions and addressed them to the best of our abilities. Um, and I can, uh, and the ones that seem most, um, the ones that seem outstanding are the invasive vegetation mm -hmm. um, and maintenance. And we've begun the maintenance process. We recently, we did a, um, a work day. We um, started on invasive species removal. Not surprisingly, it's primarily oriental bittersweet, buckthorn, um, garlic mustard. Um, we're doing, completely by hand. At this point, we don't feel like we have the expertise to do any sort of chemical treatments. Um, and we've uh, memorialized it for an annual uh, Arbor Day event, but it looks like it's gonna be two times a year. Um, we had someone come in and dethatch and then aerate the detention basin and the um, four bay. Um, Maintenance for the outlet structure seems unnecessary after 20 years, it's clean as a whistle. Seems to work quite well. Um, and uh, I think that's pretty much it. I think that the, the ongoing process is gonna be um, uh, um, tr trying hard to get rid of the oriental bittersweet. It's, uh, I mean, it's, it's, I'm afraid it's a little like shoveling sand against the tide in the fall. Um, there were some logs in the river right next to the footbridge and they got removed, but um, right up, right upstream from the logs, there were more um, oriental bittersweet seeds than you could count. Um, so I think it's just going to be an annual project and uh, not necessarily trying to remove, just clip and clip and clip and clip and clip. Yep, um, it, it's a, 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 a perpetual uh, effort is, is required and it's very rare that you actually get past it. Um, so mm -hmm. any questions, comments from commissioners? Any consideration given to renting a small herd of goats to attack the invasive plants? They will eat anything and they have re a great reputation for mowing incredible areas down. We have several farmers that are members of the lodge and uh, it did come up and I think that it'll certainly, uh, um, it'll certainly be considered. I'll bring, I'll bring it to the next meeting. Um, that would be the kind of thing that they'd, uh, they'd love to w witness. It would also be a great project with 4-H and children who had goats to participate. Mm -hmm. That's that's just the kind of thing that the, the Elks Lodge can can probably put together. Yeah, yeah. And I would just add that the documentation for this request was really substantial, and I wish all applicants would oh, take the time and effort yes. to, to do something. <laughs> small. You know, the older a permit gets, the more challenging it is. Um, but it, 
thankfully this one seems to have been constructed just as it was permitted. There were a couple of violations on the site and some other issues, but the Elks were really great about um, addressing those, although it did take a little bit of time. So I, I don't have any issues with issuing a certificate, a certificate of compliance and would recommend that. Nice. Very good. Someone want to make a motion to uh, 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 issue a certificate of compliance with the ongoing conditions um, that will be uh, uh, perpetual as a result. In effect, yes. Uh, so moved. Third. Second. And second by David. Any further comment? If not, uh, all in favor, Sarah. All right. So roll call vote for that. Beth? Yes. David? Yes. Jen? Yes. Paul? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. All right. Unanimous. All right. Um, so I think the only other item we have here is that um, Melissa Curtin is, um, has joined us um, and is actually joining. Are you being voted on by City Council this evening? I don't believe so. I think it. Uh, I think it won't happen until uh, a little bit later. Uh, I was uh, contacted by uh, Marianne Labarge at the beginning of the week, and she sent me some interview questions. Um, so I. I haven't. My homework's due tomorrow, uh, so I'll be doing that, and then uh, working on continuing to prep. So I think well, it's going to be June. Uh, well, we'll, we'll when okay. the the vote is. Yeah, it got uh, so City Council refers appointments out to the committee on. I always get confused. Uh, city Services, I believe. That's right. New appointments, they do do an interview, so that that's where you are, right yeah. now. But um, you know, based on your interest and um, past experience, it didn't seem like that would be an issue. Yeah, and, and you know, opportunity to continue to learn. Um, I apologize for my get up outfit here. I was uh, working at Look Park until 525 <laughs> on a project with a pollinator garden. So I, I, I hurried home and, and hopped on, but uh, we had been up at a wing and a prayer and then uh, brought down a bunch of uh, native plants that were, that were going to put in a, a new pollinator garden by the tennis courts, pickleball courts. Yeah. And that's... That's the plan. That's right. They have pickleball courts at Look Park as well. So, yeah. and you, can you say a little bit about your background and your interest? Uh, um, we'll have more occasions later, but sure. Um, my partner Michael and I just moved back to this area a couple of years ago. Uh, I went to UMass and I was a plant and soil science major. That's before they had an environmental studies major. Mm. Uh, they actually adopted one uh, my senior year, I think it was. Uh, and so it was, uh, and I worked in the field for uh, about 10 years doing uh, running research labs at Berkeley and at Madison on uh, biological control of plant pathogens. And then I went on to, to other things and linguistics and communication studies, but I always kept a keen, keen interest in environmental issues. So that's been a keen issue for 50 years uh, now that I'm back in the area, 50 years later. Later. Um, so I, since we moved back, we, we were um, really, uh, we really noticed how active the area is about environmental issues, about trying to have regenerative practices, uh, pollinator pathways, et cetera. And so we, as well as conservation areas. So we, we have both really embraced that. And uh, I hadn't been in New England uh, since 1978 to live, we've come back frequently. But uh, so I started taking courses immediately uh, on uh, stormwater management, pollinator uh, uh, gardens. Uh, I just got certified by the Connecticut Northeastern Organic Farmers Association as an organic land care professional. Even though I I don't have a business, I really wanted to get the knowledge. And as I you know, you, you pull a thread and it connects to other things. So now I I also belong to the Massachusetts Association of Conservation Commissions and I'm looking at the workshops, uh, the training modules uh, mm -hmm. there. So I'm trying to get things lined up, taking a, a rain, rain garden course with Yukon extension as well. Um, so just trying to get a, a solid a, a background as possible for these complex issues that 
uh, the commission has to consider. Well, well, today was a, a, a good example of uh, sometimes we have non-simple things that yes. we have to uh, yeah. uh, yes. assess. But. So, so many factors, yeah. And, you know, the interpersonal relationships, the public, the public uh, relationships are really important. So the communication skills are are yeah. impressive. I, yes. I notice. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm uh, oh, I as a layperson who never never studied any of this stuff uh, formally, I'm always grateful for people like you with that kind of background. So, yes. uh, welcome. We look forward to having you join us um, in June, and feel free to tune in. Well, I guess actually we, we won't be meeting until June. So until June 13th. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I might I might actually be uh, confirmed by then and sworn in by yeah. then. So we'll see. Great. Great. Yeah. Well, thanks Terrific. for watching. I'm, I'm impressed by uh, how well you all do. So as, as some of the community members mentioned tonight, you know, good job. And uh, it's not easy. So uh, we really appreciate well, it's, uh, it. Uh, I, I, listening isn't that hard. Um, and it, it matters to people. Yeah. That they listen to. So, um, Be heard. Sure. Exactly. Yeah, the trick is listening and staying in our lane. <laughs> yes. yes. That's yeah. the trick. And that's that's the tricky part. That's right. Yeah, and and being able to do that kind of tai chi move where you where you take something that's out of the lane and, and kind of gently <laughs> send it back uh, to that outside lane that doesn't belong here. So uh, it's it's very well done. They're very diplomatic. I'm I'm impressed. Well, uh, it, it's a good committee, um, and yeah. I value. Uh, I, I value being part of it. You, you, you'll get to know Mason, who is the he, he is the longest serving conservation commissioner in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Is that 40, right? Se Forty seven years, I think, something like that. So, uh, at least, and and he was an environmental consultant uh, before he retired. So uh, he he is one of those people who is a professional in this area. But, uh, I, I noticed a deep knowledge base uh, when he would comment. So. Yeah. Oh yeah, so you've seen it, right? No, yeah. and stormwater management, all that kind of stuff. Uh, Mason's uh, the fount of knowledge for that for for this committee. Yeah, neat. neat. But anyway, yeah. welcome. Look forward to having you join us. Thanks very right. much. Yeah, I've been sitting in since uh, later February, so uh, on the ah, meeting, so okay. taking notes and observing. So it's been very, very helpful to get oriented. So great, well, wonderful. Once again, thanks for all of your work. Okay. See you in June. Yes, see you. you see you in June. Bye bye. Anything else uh, not foreseen when the agenda was put together? I'd just like to say one thing. Thank you, and I'll invite you all over when the goats show up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if uh, I could if... say one thing, I'm sorry, Louis. I went. I met you 45, 48 years ago. I went to. I worked at uh, UMass with Steve. Yeah, I was I I was an Owen then. <laughs> oh, so it's, it's a it's a lovely small small little valley. Yeah, I remember being up at your house in Shutesbury. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> bye, bye, bye. Anyway, just wanted to say hi. Uh, Sorry. All right. <laughs> That's very good. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Bye bye. All right. Anything else, anybody? If not. Um... Motion to adjourn and Sarah, thank you as always. Uh, this is your staff report and your uh, information and, and just your poise. It's always very, very yes. helpful. Uh, yep. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And um, and does the open gov is this working for everybody? I tried to distill the, the very basics of it into that yep. how to worksheet. Um, but we are trying to figure out different ways to do things. Well, I, I I, I discovered that you have to go on and you get the screen and then you have to decide where on the screen and under files, you can yeah. find more things. So yeah. it, it took a couple of uh, tries, but I was but able it, to check. Yeah, but I, you know, with some things, I I do have to direct you there, like the public comments that um, are are being submitted periodically. But I, I try to get everything in one package as much as I can. Well, it's also great when you um, can refer to the regulations instantaneously <laughs> yes right when he said where, where does it say you have to yes uh, have <laughs> right it, here. well i've read that a hundred times but i don't know what you know whereas sarah i know she'll know exactly what page it's on, so. but
Put me on the spot. I don't mind at yep. all. <laughs> it's what I'm here for. All right. Very good. Thank you all. All right. Thank you so much, everyone.